wait until we give our opening announcement. At this time, would all sergeants please start recordings? PC recording is underway. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification? To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Borelli, we are ready to begin. Good morning. It is my pleasure to gavel in the meeting of January 26, 2021 of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. I'm Council Member Joe Borelli, and I'm the chair of this committee. I'm joined by public advocate Jumani Williams and my colleagues, uh, council members Maisel, Brannon, and Cabrera. I see thus far. I will look once again. Okay, that's all I see. Uh, today, the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management will be conducting an oversight hearing on New York City's emergency planning, as well as hearing a number of bills that are specific uh, to the city's planning for and responding to emergencies. New York City's emergency management has historically and continues to do so uh, an excellent job responding promptly to numerous types of emergencies, as well as coordinating with other city agencies to ensure the safety of all New, York New Yorkers. I wanna uh, shout out uh, our, our commissioner, or perhaps she's the former commissioner, I'm not sure if she resigned yet, uh, but, but Commissioner Cresswell uh, was just appointed to run FEMA and that is something we are all proud of and certainly is a testament to what I just said about New York City being the gold standard of emergency management. With regard to today's oversight portion of the hearing, we are interested in examining the process by which NYCEM plans for and responds to large scale emergencies. Specifically, we would like to examine how New York City EM communicates and coordinates with other city agencies, including during pre-planning stages and the actions taken during impending disasters. Furthermore, we would like to discuss the city's communication with the public prior to, during, and after emergencies and disaster. In addition to the oversight portion, we have five bills being heard today. New York City Public Advocate Jumani Williams is the prime sponsor of intros 1987 and 2057. Intro 1987 would establish a task force responsible for reviewing emergency plans of each city agency and issuing annual reports on the recommended changes to such plans addressing potential deficits as identified by the task force. Intro 2057 would require NYCEM in consultation with the Mayor's Office of Food Policy and the Department of Education to develop a plan to provide students with breakfast, lunch, and dinner in the event that schools are ordered closed or when any form of remote learning is being used by the DOE. We'll also hear intro 849, introed by Council Member Levine. Intro 849 would create an interagency task force to examine the city's effort to provide assistance and services to individuals relocating to New York City after being displaced by a natural disaster event somewhere else. Intro 1949, introduced by Council Member Cumbo, would require New York City Emergency Management to ensure the periodic review of all plans guiding the city's response to and ensuring the continuity of agency operations during emergency circumstances. Representatives from all relevant city agencies would be required to participate in this review. Uh, and finally, Intro 2088, introduced by Council Member Cabrera, would require the New York City Emergency Management to submit an annual report to the Council describing the city's preparation for and response to the public health emergencies. I'm looking forward to hearing the administration's testimony uh, on this general oversight topic and specifically on these bills. And I am going to first turn over the microphone to our, our friend, public advocate Williams for his opening remarks on these two bills. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Jumani Williams, public advocate for the city of New York. Uh, thank Chair Borelli for holding this hearing today. Uh, the best time to prepare for a crisis is actually probably yesterday. Uh, a lot can be said about the city's preparations and responses during the pandemic. But as was mentioned, uh, there have been uh, good jobs at 
uh, negotiating other other emergencies in the past, uh, not so much here in the pandemic. Uh, this mis the mistakes made amid the early days were significant and it caused confusion and worry among New Yorkers. My office received several calls and messages from constituents on various issues, such as where to obtain food and the status of schools. Frankly, we could have, we had the time to and should have done better. That's why I'm uh, very proud to introduce uh, these two bills being heard today to make sure we do better in future crisis. We must ensure the mistakes from last year do not repeat itself. Uh, unfortunately, I see some of the same mistakes repeating itself currently. That's uh, maybe a topic for another discussion. New Yorkers do not have time to wait. These bills, along with the many others being heard today, codify an immediate response from whenever a crisis or state of emergency occurs. First bill intro number 1987 will create a state of emergency response and recovery task force. It becomes active during any state of emergency, either by the mayor or by the governor. This task force reviews the city's emergency plans and recommends policy proposals if needed. A report is issued after the revision of the city's plan. The public advocate, the mayor, and the speaker appoint members to the task force. It is evident that the city did not adequately prepare for a pandemic, a criticism that can be directed for the entire country, in fact. We must review what we went wrong, what we missed, and how we can prepare ahead of another possible pandemic or disaster. Our city deserves better, and I anticipate this bill will help us. The second bill, intro number 2057, creates an emergency food plan for students. Specifically, the Office of Emergency Management, Mayor's Office of Food Policy, and Department of Education all must create a plan to serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner to students whenever schools are closed or remote learning is used. All three agencies must provide specific plans, such as how to notify the public on locations to pick up the food. Food insecurity is a serious problem within our city, and it's one of the things that has been made worse during this pandemic. A few months before the pandemic, a 2019 report by Hunger Free America found that one in eight New Yorkers, about one million, were food insecure. That was before the pandemic. Undoubtedly, that number is much worse because of the pandemic, and our students are a part of that number. Students may rely on schools for a meal because there is not enough food at home. But when schools are closed, where would they go? That question remained a major concern during the early days of the crisis. And anytime the mayor needs to consider closure, whether that be for inclement weather or a natural disaster, students suffering from constant hunger is a serious problem. How can we expect students to concentrate at home, in some cases without internet access, let alone without food? These students will be set up for failure without help. This is especially true for homeless students who lack both the stable housing and food insecurity, and at least 116,000 New York City students, or better, one in 10 of our students experience homelessness. That is a crisis within a crisis. This bill means the city provides meals to the public that are accessible to anyone who needs it during a crisis or remote learning. We must not leave and cannot leave our students, particularly those who are homeless and are more color behind. The bills before the committee today are intended to be proactive measures in the face of a crisis. New Yorkers deserve immediate answers. Instead, what we saw and heard was a wait and see approach, often confusing, conflicting messages. This cannot be the standard in the future. And I'm glad to see the council members introduce solutions uh, to ensure the government works for the people who elected us. I wanna thank the speaker as well and the council for the leadership they showed during this uh, time. In general, the intention of these bills in front of the committee today is having New York City prepared whether there's another pandemic or natural disaster. New Yorkers need assistance and assurances of leadership. Again, I thank the chair for allowing me to speak. Look forward to the testimony today. Uh, thank you. We, we've also been joined by council member Haim Deutsch, who is representing Brooklyn. Uh, next, we'll hear from council member and the chair of our health committee, uh, Mark Levine, to discuss his bill. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and um, great to see the public advocate here fighting on these critical issues. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. I want to speak on intro 849, which would require the city to develop a system for managing the arrival of refugees to New York City after a natural disaster in another part of the country or world. This is not a hypothetical. This occurred in 2017 when uh, Hurricane Maria sent thousands of refugees off the island of Puerto Rico, many of whom arrived here in our city because of strong historical and family ties. And we learned the hard way 
that we weren't prepared to support them as a city. Uh, we relied too heavily on the federal government, which uh, failed to approve many of their applications for assistance or cut them off from assistance too quickly. And it was pretty clear that these refugees needed not just connection to housing, to food assistance, to a variety of social services, legal assistance, and more. So our bill, intro 849, would require the creation of a task force composed of representatives of the relevant city agencies to prepare a management plan so that the next time refugees arrive here to our city, we are prepared. And in the era of climate change, I'm afraid uh, we should assume that this will be only too frequent. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for hearing this bill today. Um, very much appreciate this opportunity to push this legislation forward. Thank you, back to you. Thank you, Council Member Levine. Next, we have our friend from the Bronx, Council Member Fernando Cabrero, to talk about his bill. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your leadership for allowing us to speak on these bills and, and also to the members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on my bill in 2088. We were caught off guard by the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact of being unprepared is wide ranging and long term, not just in terms of public health, but our economy, our children's education and future, numerous industries and entire future and character of New York City. The city needs to be prepared for the future emergency, including pandemics, and to know where our weaknesses exist in healthcare delivery and related emergency systems. Intro 2088 will require the Commissioner of the New York City Emergency Management to submit an annual report to the Council describing the city's preparation for and respond to any state disaster emergency or local state of emergency related to an infectious disease that affects the city's public health. The report would include a description of any actions taken in preparation for, during, and immediately after the incident by or on behalf of the city, a list of all city agencies, offices, or private entities that were involved in the city's emergency response, and a description of the city's current public health care workforce and ways to improve medical surge capacity and guidelines for notifying and communicating with the public and city officials during a local public health emergency. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I do not see a Majority Leader Combo. If that's the case, we will proceed. Okay, uh, I will turn this over to Josh Kingsley, the Council to the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management, uh, who will recite some things that he probably recites in his sleep by now. Uh, Josh, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Borelli. Um, I'm Josh Kingsley. I'm Council to the Fire and Emergency Management Committee of the New York City Council. Um, I don't have this recited to memory yet. Apologies, uh, council member. Um, before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone who will be um, testifying that you'll be on mute until you're called to testify, after which you'll be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will periodically be announcing who's the next panelist. Wait, uh, Josh, can we can we pause for a second? Yeah. Uh, I see Majority Leader Cumbo, so I want to give her or the opportunity to uh, uh, join us and speak a bit about her bill. Majority Leader. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I thank you so much, Councilmember Borelli, for opening uh, the discussion to me at this time. If you could just give me one moment. having a little technical difficulty, but I'm right here. Okay, thank you so much for your time. And I'm very excited that you have been so open to hearing my bill intro 1949, as we continue to battle the lasting effects of COVID-19. 
Today, through the hearing of intro 1949, we are taking proactive steps to ensure that our city's emergency planning process is sufficient to respond to our community's needs. My bill would require the Office of Emergency Management to ensure the periodic review of all plans guiding the city's response to and ensuring the continuity of agency operations during emergency circumstances. Although New York City has taken steps towards disaster preparedness, our response to COVID-19 has been far more reactive than proactive. At the peak of the pandemic, our preparedness was apparent, our unpreparedness, as I should say, was apparent through the lack of supplies at all levels. A lack of PPE and ventilators led to unsafe working conditions and even the death of many patients and employees in our hospitals. Mutual aid groups popped up to respond to food insecurity and reach our most vulnerable populations. Our educational system was forced to reimagine itself without any time for logistical coordination, leaving thousands of students without the proper tools for success. Now that the same reactive approach has been taken with regard to vaccine distribution, resulting in confusion and unequal distribution. This pattern cannot continue. And as legislators, we have a duty to intervene. And that is exactly what um, intro 1949 was designed to do. And so I thank you so much. I look forward to hearing from the administration and to asking questions as well as responding to questions. Thank you, Chair Borelli. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Josh, if you would continue uh, from before, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, so where was I? So the first panelist to give testimony will be representatives from New York City Emergency Management. Uh, testimony will be provided by NISUM's De Deputy Director of Readiness, Jake Cooper, and Assistant Commissioner of Interagency Coordination, Joanna Conroy. I will call on you when it's your turn to speak. Uh, during the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. I will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Cooper and Assistant Commissioner Conroy, I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these committees and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Dep Deputy okay. Commissioner Cooper. I do. And Assistant Commissioner Conroy. I do. You may begin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Borelli and Public Advocate Williams and members of the New York City Council. I am Jake Cooper, Deputy Commissioner for Readiness at New York City Emergency Management. I'm joined by my colleague, Johanna Conroy, Assistant Commissioner for Interagency Operations. We're pleased to be here to discuss emergency planning for the City of New York. New York City Emergency Management helps New Yorkers before, during, and after emergencies through preparedness, education, and response. The agency is responsible for coordinating citywide emergency planning and response for all types and scales of emergencies. It is staffed by more than 200 dedicated professionals with diverse backgrounds and areas of expertise, including individuals assigned from other city agencies. We have been fully activated for COVID-19 for almost one year. During this time, there have been multiple overlapping activations such as heat emergencies, snowstorms, tropical storm Isaias, and smaller emergencies that require interagency coordination, including building collapses, fires, infrastructure incidents, water main breaks, and other events. Additionally, emergency management has assisted with large scale programs such as Get Food, Get Cool, and more recently, the Vaccine Command Center. For the first time ever, we have run operations and emergencies mostly virtually, although many staff have worked in person and like everyone else in the city, we have not been immune to the personal and devastating impacts of COVID-19. Allow me a moment to express my gratitude to the workers of emergency management who have literally worked around the clock over the past year in an unending activation cycle while also continuing our non-emergency work mandates and responsibilities as well. For a small agency, this is no small feat, and we should all be grateful and thankful to the dedication and commitment of the city's emergency managers. Let me now discuss how, agency, how the agency coordinates planning efforts. As we all know, every emergency can create new and unforeseen conditions. Emergency management is responsible for the development, maintenance, and oversight of 150 planning documents, spanning plans, protocols, field guides, 
and standard operating procedures. For multiple natural and man-made hazards, plans are either operationally specific, such as debris management, or hazard specific, such as the New York City Coastal Storm Plan. They include citywide objectives for managing the incident, logistical resource needs, templates for interagency coordination and data management, and checklists for key tasks and actions. These plans include coordinated roles and responsibilities of key stakeholders, primary, primarily city agencies, for these events are formalized under the citywide incident management, SIMS, uh, incident management system, or SIMS. SIMS re relies on assigning responsibility to particular emergencies based on agencies' core competencies. For example, NYPD is responsible for law enforcement investigating terrorism. Fire department is responsible for fire suppression. Sanitation is responsible for snow and garbage removal. And Department of Health is responsible for public health, pandemics, etc. This year, the city is updating SIMS in a multi-agency and comprehensive effort. Emergency management's planning process is one of collaboration and coordination. We follow a phased approach that starts with initiation, develop, finalize, distribute, and socialize. In the initiation phase, we identify planning needs and relevant stakeholders. This can include city agencies, state and federal partners, private sector partners, not-for-profit not partners, and community organizations. In the development phase, we work closely with relevant city agencies and other stakeholders to create document objectives, scope, and detailed operations. Emergency management coordinates and conducts many interagency planning meetings to accomplish this work. In the finalization phase, we build document components and circulate for a re review among internal and external partners. In the distribution and socialization phase, we internally publish the documents and, and distribute to internal and external stakeholders. Planning documents are not publicized or made public due to the sensitive nature of many of the tactical operations included in them. Information on locations of staging areas, locations of key resources, and specific capabilities of agencies are privileged information and not beneficial for public consumption. All of this planning requires testing and training to make plans that are operational, usable, and ready to go. We have a robust training and exercise program to build capacity for implementation. We exercise our plans consistently with all stakeholders. Last year, despite the pandemic and having to move EOC activities virtually, emergency management held 21 different exercises and tested parts or entirety of plans. Planning documents are reviewed yearly with updates coming at least once every three years. Updates come about for a number of reasons, including threat trends, agency priorities, stakeholder priorities, and other factors. Our plans are meant to serve as a guide, a living document rather than a static one on how to respond to a particular emergency. Given that every emergency is different, plans are designed to be scalable and have different elements activated or not based upon need. Coupled with training and exercises, part of emergency management's continuous improvement effort is the evaluation of emergency response and activations through a multi-agency assessment process called after action review. This includes fact-finding through post-emergency debrief sessions, surveys, interviews, document reviews, leading to an after action report with recommendations for improvement and then implementing those recommendations. Emergency planning in New York City incorporates multiple levels of coordination and collaboration and cooperation. I'm happy to discuss further during your questions. Now I will speak briefly about the legislation we are hearing today. Regarding introduction 849-2018, 1949-2020, and 1987-2020, we look forward to working with you to satisfy the intent of these bills and further inform the council on how we plan for, respond to, and recover from emergencies. We already share information on our plans and multiple plans themselves with the council based on legislation passed after Hurricane Sandy. As previously noted, while we share overall information about how the city plans for emergencies on our website for the public, we do not publish the actual plans as they contain sensitive information from partner agencies who may not collaborate with us in the future if they knew their details would be made public, especially those with sensitive agency operations or those outside city government structure. However, we do have built-in public assessment in certain components, such as our yearly public hearings conducted by the Disabilities Access and Functional Needs Unit, also known as DAFN, 
with members of the Daphne community to better inform our emergency planning surrounding this community. In reference to introduction 2057-2020, which creates an emergency student food plan, the New York City Department of Education possesses, possesses the core competency for feeding students, which they've carried out continuously through the COVID-19 emergency. DOE and the Mayor's Office of Food Policy should be brought into discussions on this bill and where it best fits. In reference to introduction 2088, which requires emergency management to report on the city's preparedness and response to citywide public health emergencies, this likely better handled by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, given their expertise. We are happy to have a broader discussion about informing the council on our planning. However, we are not the subject matter expert to report on this type of emergency. Thank you for allowing me to inform the public on how emergency management plans for emergencies and to comment on this legislation. As you can see, planning for emergencies is a complex endeavor requiring constant collaboration, consultation, and coordination. We're extraordinarily proud of the work we have done to plan for emergencies in New York City while realizing that improvement is an ever-present goal. As an agency, it is our core mission to plan for, respond to, and recover from emergencies. We take those responsibilities very seriously and look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Commissioner. So, I mean, you actually answered a lot of the questions that I had uh, jotted down ahead of time. Um, but the, the first question I will ask is, is this. I've been chair of this committee for three years now, over three years, and uh, we've talked a, a lot about the planning uh, that NYCEM does in advance of different dangers and uh, potential situations. I've never heard a pandemic mentioned prior to 2020. So mm -hmm. w was there significant agency planning for a pandemic in, in conjunction with the health agencies? And uh, the second part is, how do you pick what disasters are on the menu of things New York City EM prepares for? You know, in other words, do you, do you prepare for tornadoes? Do you prepare for, a I mean, a volcano is not going to happen, right? So I'm assuming that's not on the menu of things, but how do you pick and choose what will be within the agency's purview to respond to? Thank you. Okay. Um, let me answer the, the pandemic planning question first, Chair Burley. So, um, the city does have a pandemic plan. The Department of Health and uh, uh, Mental Hygiene has that plan. The city also has an H1N1 plan. Um, and I think the thing to remember why we didn't have a COVID-19 plan, we had elements of other plans mm -hmm. such as, you know, sort of commodities distribution and food. We had um, the public uh, health and safety plan for workers that was used to leverage. We, we take elements of those all hazard plans and combine them with DOHMH's uh, pandemic plan and also things we learned from, from H1N1. So um, I, I talked about um, in my testimony that many emergencies are, are novel in nature where there's something that was different about it. And I think that's why really we do that, that, that two-prong approach of you know, hazard specific planning and then the all hazards approach, which you can apply those to any type of an emergency. And, you know, they're guides, uh, they're meant to be scalable and flexible. Um, and so for, for uh, COVID-19, we really pulled from a lot of those different uh, plans to sort of respond. Now, um, on sort of how do we pick uh, things that we plan for? It, it's a great question. Um, there's a, there's a few ways. There's a formal process that we go through that we're required to do that's uh, called FIRA. It's uh, threats, hazards, risk uh, assessment that we have to do, required to do that by FEMA. But it's actually a process that brings in all the stakeholders and partners uh, from city agencies. And we go through and we talk about all the different hazards and do a hazard analysis essentially, and look uh, towards you know, where are potential gaps. Where are areas we need to exercise more on? Where are training needs? Where is there a gap in planning? And through that process, we often come up with sort of uh, um, uh, areas or hazards that we need to focus on. So that's, that's one way we do it. That's a very formal process, but it engages a lot of partners um, 
and you know we're required to do that um, that process. The other way we do it is we look at what's going on in the nation, obviously, or 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 we look at other disasters to see what threats are out there. I think one of the um, I'll give you a good example that um, uh, NYC three working with Jewett and NYPD have been working on related to cyber. So. They looked at the things that happened in Atlanta. They looked at the things that happened in, in San Francisco and sort of issues of ransomware. Now there's already a city cyber plan, but after that event, they started to look at their protocols and come up with different, um, start to tease out some of those issues or things that could come up related on that. So that's another way. A third way is based on priorities of other city agencies, um, threats change, um, Obviously, like when we've done these hazard analysis now, people are very um, interested in working on, on on further pandemic planning, which obviously you know we are doing. Um, so that's another way coming from city agencies uh, or or the state um, is another way. Sorry, that was very long winded. I apologize. No, it's, it's okay. I mean, that's that, that's a great answer. Um, can you go over? how your agency interacts with your counterparts in other jurisdictions, whether they be uh, the state and federal you know, government or just other large cities around the US? Sure. So let me talk about um, something we're really proud of um, that was started a few commissioners ago. <laughs> I've been in emergency management since 2002, but there was a group called um, Big City Emergency Managers. One thing that we saw um, is that really the, the, there is not um, a lot of, there used to be not a lot of attention paid to, to urban areas. The, the, the planning and the response is different in urban areas. A lot of emergency management is, um, is focused on state coordination. Um, and I think that we, cr we created this body called uh, Big City Emergency Managers, which is a group that uh, meets on a monthly basis and then actually uh, virtually uh, but then they also uh, usually have uh, one or two times a year, we'll have an in-person meeting to share lessons learned. So uh, that form has been really excellent in connecting the problems that are really uh, unique to urban areas as opposed to uh, states or, or more rural areas. Um, so that's one way. Uh, in terms of uh, the state, uh, we work very closely with the state. Um, through state emergency management. Um, we're constantly talking to them. Um, they're involved with all our exercises. They're at, um, they, uh, we also work with them, which um, they have their own, uh, I mentioned Thyra and not to keep on throwing out acronyms, but there's uh, SEPA, which is a capability uh, assessment they ask us to do um, with them, which is a, another good process that helps us determine planning gaps, exercise needs, or training needs. Um, so that's where I work with the state. And, you know, the federal government, we work with um, uh, quite a bit uh, through the state and also the Region 2 office. And obviously, um, FEMA, uh, we collaborate on with training and exercising. Um, and also different technology. We have an Office of Science and Technology of Homeland Security, which is here um, in the city that we do exercises with and, and, and things. So there's a lot of different connecting points, but those are the more uh, formal way, formal ways. Uh, thank you. I have questions on some of the bills that we're hearing, but I wanna give an opportunity for the sponsors to get the first crack at them. Um, so if you are a council member who sponsored a bill and would like to speak, just click the thing. I'll give you a second. If not, I shall ask a couple of questions myself. Uh, Councilman Levine. Thank you, Mr. Chad. Uh, just very briefly, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to ask the, uh, the deputy commissioner about uh, questions of refugees arriving to New York City due to crisis elsewhere, as I mentioned in my opening statement related to intro 849. Does, does uh, NYC emergency management support other jurisdictions in preparing emergency response to national disa natural disasters? Uh, Council member, so you're asking if we help other jurisdictions, help them prepare to accept people also that would be displaced? 
Well, I'm actually talking about, I guess, pre pre refugee crisis. Whether you support in the in the disaster response uh, jurisdictions that are less capable than us that can use our support. Yeah. Um, so uh, we share um, the, the the same concerns that you have about displaced uh, people um, coming from other disaster areas. The city has a, a tradition of this. You know, you look at Hurricane Katrina and the things that. Um, this agency working with uh, formerly HRA and DSS, the things that he did to help people. And then obviously more recently, um, Hurricane Maria um, and setting up services for those people. Um, we, uh, when we were dealing with uh, some of the issues we were, uh, I remember talking to the state of Florida, the city of Miami, to, to, cause they were experiencing things sometimes on a different timeline. We, we talked to these places uh, other cities, because they may experience uh, a wave of people before we do and share uh, lessons learned. I remember uh, uh, specifically about Maria talking to the state of Florida about housing. You know, that's the, the universally really difficult issue. And I think it's obviously compounded in New York City because there is a shortage of, of affordable housing and that, and that crunch that we feel. Um, and we also spoke to... Uh, sort of other uh, uh, large cities up the, up the coast. But I remember talking to Florida, Miami, and the state quite a bit. Um, I, I appreciate that. And just for time, I'll, I'll just want to ask a follow-up. So what, once refugees arrive here, then who's in charge of supporting their resettlement? Is it NISIM? So I, you know, uh, it's in conjunction with us. I, just to talk about our role as the coordinating agency, we worked very close, closely with DSS, Department of Social Services, um, the main service provider that would be providing services for them, which also has the Department of Homeless Services under them. So uh, also though, we did work with, uh, so we were, I would say the connective tissue a lot of times to bring these other uh, community groups in. Um, it could be uh, bringing in other city agencies or state resources. Uh, but we share a big part of that responsibility, but the main service provider, I would say the lead agency for that core competency was, was DSS. Uh, but we were, obviously we're working hand in hand, that service center that we ran with them um, and other city agencies was, was a very much a collaborative effort. But, uh, and I'm sorry to go be long in the tooth, but the, the other thing you have to remember, I mean, we are, we are 250 people at most. And so we really, in order to get the most done, we need to empower other agencies to take the lead on things. You know, for a catastrophic event, um, we can't run everything and lead everything. Um, we need agencies to do that as well, like they did. And I think that that service center is another example of that, uh, that was in um, Spanish Harlem after for Hurricane Maria. Yes, un understood. So uh, in addition to housing, which is obviously first and foremost for refugees, what, what else is, is on the list of the menu of services that you, you seek to provide to refugees? Uh, food, clothing, transportation um, in some situations, uh, language resources, um, uh, you know, uh, particularly in that incident, you know, language uh, providing uh, services in the appropriate language was really important. Um, and then, you know, the community organizations that were there we're really helping integrate people into the community, which I think was very important too. And I would, of course, add medical care, mental health care, and legal assistance to that list. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and I'm going to wrap up for time, but I'll just point out that we've we've hit six or eight different programmatic areas that uh, we acknowledge refugees need support on, and that the the intent of Intro 849 is to create a unified entity that can coordinate across those various entities to, to have a plan in place. Um, I won't say if, but when uh, we're faced with another refugee crisis in New York City. So um, I'm gonna wrap up there uh, to keep it brief, but thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I'll now recognize Majority Leader Cumbo for her questions. Thank you so much. Um, 
Mr. Cooper wanted to uh, focus on 1949 mm -hmm. and to ask further questions. I know when I came into office initially, we were dealing with the dynamics of Hurricane Sandy. And I watched as many of our colleagues were being uh, very uh, reactive in terms of having to scramble to find solutions or uh, opportunities to work with our different agencies or public spaces like our schools and otherwise um, for shelter and resources. In, in terms of 1949, um, my question is, do you feel that um, it's possible for us to become more proactive in terms of anticipating what are the various kinds of emergencies that could happen and how do we work through them? And most importantly, I would say, and what is the city count and how do you feel this, the city council could be a partner in that work? Because I feel that, and, and I'm hoping that this legislation would address that, is that the siloed approach that happens often leaves when a disaster happens that we have to start from scratch on how to address it. Yeah, um, council member that um, the siloed approach is uh, uh, something I entirely agree with what you're saying. It, it really creates uh, a very difficult response. And I think as the coordinating agency, um, emergency management works to break down those silos. Um, and I think we do that a lot of different ways through training and exercise. But also, I think it's really important um, just to bring in um, when I talked about the planning process, that it's important to engage your stakeholders in the planning process and not create something in a vacuum and expect it to work. So I just want to echo the things that you were saying. I, I agree, silos are never good. Um, so it, with specifically about um, 1949, there are some, you know, we'd like to talk further about it. There are some aspects of it that are uh, beneficial. And I think that, you know, uh, making some summaries or components of plans available to the public is something we would like to talk further about. Um, we think that's beneficial for the public to know some of the things that are, are, are in place. Um, I think one of the ways that city council can really help us and, and city council does help us with this, um, is get the word out. Um, and I know through uh, the elected official calls that we've run, you guys are, uh, th this body in particular is one of the best amplifiers of that message and to continue to do that. But also encourage your constituencies to sign up for Notify NYC so they get that real time emergency uh, information that we constantly push out. Um, but also, uh, uh, as you know, I I'm sure a lot of you know about our Ready New York campaign um, you know, we really, uh, one of the things we want to do is get the, uh, the public to, to prepare themselves, you know, household preparedness, uh, really the more of that we can do, uh, the, the more time we can devote to, to, uh, vulnerable populations and people that, that truly need our help. So I think we could talk about how you can, uh, help us city council. That's definitely one way to continue to do that and amplify those things. Um, and then, oh, sorry, go ahead. I want to, I guess, digging deeper into it, sure. something that I, I mean, what I was hoping that the intent of this legislation would do would be to identify what those disasters could be, whether it's a hurricane, uh, a tornado, or um, a massive shooting, or uh, all these different kinds of things that could happen, like a uh, germ warfare like we're seeing like with the pandemic like COVID. It's all these different things that require different responses. Mm -hmm. So as a council member, it would be far more empowering if even on a quarterly basis that we meet to discuss how these plans are functioning and operating such as what schools can be used as fallout shelters, what in the, in the situation of like a Sandy or a Hurricane Katrina style, where are the areas where we can direct our communities to if they have to go to for shelter? Where are the areas that people can go to that we can immediately direct them to food? 
where the area is in terms of if people have medical issues such as um, diabetes and they have to uh, have heart medication or they have to have uh, insulin or whatever the dynamics are, yeah. Yeah. that yeah. these things are set up in a way that an elected leader is completely empowered to know this is my fallout shelter. This is the schools that we'll direct people to. These are the modes of communication that are then presented to us to be able to communicate because not everybody's a Justin Brennan, right? So we all are not gonna have the level of social media outreach um, <laughs> as some of our colleagues, right? So some of us have to have that ability to be able to communicate um, in times of emergency um, yeah. that's effective for an entire district. Like it would be a shame if our modes of being able to reach our district are based off of your following versus, you know, what radio programs are accessible to us? How can we reach? It's so many different things that um, we've had to learn. I think also there should be a listing of telephone numbers that, you know, that your office, Office of Emergency Management, all of these different offices, like, help us to coordinate working documents and lists of, you know, all of our NYCHA development leaders, all of our tenant association leaders. A lot of this we have from events that we do, but there's got to be a lot more in terms of even how do we train those um, tenant association leaders who have taken on these responsibilities, how are they then trained to work with our leaders, to work with their communities in times of emergency, to know what to do in those spaces? And I just feel like, yeah. you know, unfortunately, that that really hasn't happened. So um, there's a lot for me to unpack there. So I'm going to try to address um, some of the things that you that you you talked about and first to talk about um, facility specific things like this um, desire that you talked about about being able to tell your constituency where the fallout shelter is or or those sorts of things so we do planning on that granular letter up uh, that level um, for shelters and and such not we're we're very um, careful this is one of the things we're concerned about is releasing that information in the public because um, mm -hmm. We don't, uh, there could be, a, there's a few operational concerns. You know, we have uh, these um, number of shelters over, over 400 um, and we have evacuation centers, but we don't open them all simultaneously. We open them up based upon need. So we want to push people to evacuation centers. The concern is that sometimes things come up, air conditioners break, there could be a capital project going on at a school. And so we really want to uh, have that type of information um, uh, given to the public, you know, right before the disaster. So when they go to that place that was designated a shelter, that is indeed open. Um, so I think that's mm -hmm. one of the concerns, but I think you're pointing something out that I agree with. It's like, how do we get that information to people? I think, it, you know, I, again, this bill, I think it would be good to talk more about uh, some of the things. And if, and if that means talking to the city council uh, members more and educating them on components of these plans and ways to amplify the message on them uh, before a disaster or during a disaster. I think that's a, a worthwhile discussion, I agree. Um, another thing uh, I wanna address was you, you talked like about, um, like you talked about NYCHA develops and developments and how to you know kind of train people on how to deal with that. I think one of the best avenues and it's been very successful and it's just continuing to do this is our community emergency response teams, which are CERT, which are, are volunteers that help um, during a disaster. And so I think that getting people to train with CERT, uh, working with NYCHA with that and, uh, and people that uh, community liaisons uh, that work for NYCHA, you know, I think that would be uh, a great initiative to sort of amplify that um, to improve that type of response. And then, you know, sort of have uh, boots on the ground that are dealing with uh, people in those uh, 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 facilities. Can I just, I just want to conclude with this because sure. I, I, I like my bill, but as I'm even talking to you, I feel like I, I need more, I need more bills or I need to go deeper <laughs> into this bill more because bills. I feel essentially that where we need to go as a city 
is that we can no longer have emergency preparedness plans in case of an emergency. We have to live and work and function almost as if we know there is a pending emergency always going to happen. You know, I feel like it's, we've kind of looked at it like, I hope everything's gonna go okay and nothing happens. But it's like, we've seen with 9-11, we've seen with Hurricane Sandy, we've seen with COVID, like emergencies and disasters are now a frequent part of our life. And so unfortunately, we as a society and people have to live more in a state of emergency than not. And so, you know, regular briefings about emergency preparedness, regular briefings about contact information, regular briefings about your fallout shelter that was once a fallout shelter is now having capital construction. We're now gonna move you to the Atlantic Armory. We're now gonna move this to that. It, you know, it has to be that we as a city move forward in a way of always being constantly updated and prepared our city has to become prepared. It's like I, I've traveled very infrequently to California and it, it's a different kind of thing, but like how the students there are prepared to stop, drop, go underneath certain spaces and safe places when they know an earthquake is about to happen because they know that that's a part of their life. Yeah. So we know that emergencies of all sorts are now a part of our life and we have to rev up to understanding that that's a regular part of our lifestyle now. And, I, and I'll conclude with that. Can I, can I, I you're not going to get disagreement from me on a lot of what you just said, because I think, again, I just want to plug our Ready New York program, because the things that you're saying are really central tenets of, of personal preparedness. And uh, like you said, um, that the, the public needs to be informed about disasters and how to respond to them. And this Ready New York campaign is really, um, I think, one of the best avenues to do that because everybody that can needs to take care of themselves so we can help people that need our help. You know, um, so, but I, I agree a lot with what you said. Thank you. Sure. And we'll be in touch. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I I forgot where my fallout shelter was. I'm not I'm not too uh, familiar where where mine is. I definitely have to follow up with that uh, majority leader. I uh, here I, to I, help. I definitely agree with you that uh, students don't seem as prepared uh, as perhaps they should be uh, for a certain threats and problems. Um, I I do not have any more questions about the legislation. If no one else uh, has any more questions, we will conclude this panel. And if that's the case, then that is fine. Thank you. Thank you both uh, very much for uh, testifying, uh, and uh, we appreciate your participation. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Um, Josh, is there any more public testimony? There is not, Chair. Okay. Um, at this time, if you have not been recognized and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. I don't see. So I will conclude this hearing and wish everyone a good, a happy new year. I wish the co former commissioner a best of luck monitoring emergencies for our country at FEMA. And thank you both for participating. Uh, we are over. <laughs>